In 1886, Albert Bond joined the Hamburg America Line as head of the passenger department. He was soon elected to the board, and in 1899, he became the company's general director. Born in Hamburg to the Danish owner of an immigration agency, Bond was quickly immersed in the world of the transatlantic passenger trade. When his father passed away in 1874, Bond inherited the family business and developed it into an independent shipping line. He maximized profits by carrying passengers to America and then filling his ships with cargo on their return voyages. This early success was what brought him to the Hamburg America line, where his innovative thinking quickly catapulted him into leadership. In January 1891, recognizing that passenger numbers on the North Atlantic waned in the rough winter months, Bolland sent the SS Augusta Victoria on a six-week pleasure cruise on the Mediterranean. At the time, this was thought to be a ridiculous idea, but the voyage proved a great success. Wealthy passengers loved the concept, and demand for cruises quickly grew. In 1900, Hamburg America launched the Princess and Victoria Louise, widely credited as the first purpose-built cruise ship. But this was only the beginning of Bond's innovations. In the late 19th century, the majority of immigrants passing through Germany traveled through Bremerhaven. To bring more of these travelers through Hamburg, Bolland constructed an immigration hall on the nearby island of Fede. These new facilities could accommodate thousands of migrants every week, and it's estimated that 5 million people passed through what became known as Ballenstad. Hamburg became especially attractive to European Jews fleeing economic and religious hardship. Ballen, who was Jewish himself, included both a synagogue and facilities that served kosher food, one of the only ports to offer such accommodations. Ballen wasn't just concerned with getting people on his ships, he was also obsessed with creating the best possible conditions for every passenger, from the wealthy elite that occupied palatial suites to the poorest families traveling in steerage. Whenever he crossed the Atlantic himself, he spent his days and nights carefully observing everything from the food on board and ventilation to the use of different lounges and amenities. These voyages would result in changes across the fleet that included things like reducing the number of notices posted to providing larger towels, only in first class. Bolland's Jewish background made it difficult to find social acceptance among the other directors of the company. However, he managed to gain the confidence and admiration of Kaiser Wilhelm II, who recognized Bolland's genius and saw him as a key component of his ambitions to dominate the North Atlantic. Long jealous of Britain's naval supremacy, the Kaiser recognized that the key to gaining the upper hand wasn't just in building out his navy, it was also critical to establish a mighty fleet of merchant ships. The competition between nations to build the largest, most powerful ocean liners was something like the space race of the era. Vanity played a major role, and size mattered. Before we get any further on Albert Bond, I want to take a quick second to talk about this video sponsor, Incogni. Do you ever miss the days when you got phone calls from family and friends and not just a bunch of telemarketers? Once your information is out there, it feels like there's almost nothing you can do to get your privacy back. That's why I'm excited to talk about this video sponsor, Incogni. There are hundreds of data brokers out there who aggregate your personal information, potentially including your name, social security number, login credentials, location history, online activity, and much, much more. If you request that these data brokers remove your information, they legally have to do it. The problem is they obviously make this extremely hard to do, and most people don't even know where to get started. That's where Incogni comes in. With one simple sign-up, Incogni will reach out to data brokers on your behalf and request that they remove your personal information. They will handle the whole removal process for you. And it's not just a one-time thing. They will monitor to make sure your data stays off the market and remove it whenever it pops up again. This keeps you safe and cuts down on all that annoying spam. And now Incogni is offering an incredible deal for Black Friday. The first 100 of you that use the code OLDBOATS using the link below will get 60% off of Incogni. Thank you to Incogni for once again supporting the channel. Now back to the Limperator, I mean, Imperator. Bolland had a close relationship with his competitors across the channel, and he kept a watchful eye on their upcoming projects. When he learned that the White Star Line would respond to Cunard's Mauritania and Lusitania with a trio of massive 45,000 ton liners, easily the largest ever built, he knew that Germany had to respond with something bold. The resulting liners would be Albert Bolland's greatest achievement.
While speed was a priority, like the White Star Line, Bullen recognized that vying for the Blue Ribbon had diminishing returns. Instead, this new trio would compete on size. Unsurprisingly, the Kaiser signed off on the plans, eager to one-up his British cousins. Originally, the contract was going to go to Harland and Wolf, the same shipyard that built several previous German liners. But in an atmosphere of ever-rising nationalism, new government mail contracts required ships to be constructed in German shipyards. The first of the new trio was awarded to the newly expanded Fulkenwerk shipyard in Hamburg. Labeled yard number 314, her hull was laid down on June 18, 1910. Her design would adopt many of the innovations seen on Cunard's Mauritania and Lusitania, as well as those found on the White Star Line's soon-to-be-launched Olympic. She was powered by quadruple screws driven by steam turbines and featured sweeping interior spaces, outclassing everything that came before her. Her length would exceed 900 feet or 274 meters, making her comfortably larger than the Olympic class in both length and tonnage. By the spring of 1912, she was ready to launch. Opog's board of directors selected the name Imperator as a flattering gesture to Kaiser Wilhelm II, who maintained a vested interest in the project throughout. She was launched on May 23, 1912, only a little over a month after the Titanic disaster. The Kaiser would christen the new ship himself, dressed as an admiral in a ceremony that echoed the launch of a great naval ship. But the event didn't go off flawlessly. Just after the Kaiser joined Albert Ballin on his private platform, a plank that was improperly secured to her bow broke off and fell only feet away from the Kaiser, who managed to jump back just in time to miss getting hit. He was unhurt and quickly resumed the ceremony. The massive hole soon began thundering down her slipway. To help stop her once she hit the water, she was launched with both anchors. As she slid into the water, the order was given to let go her port anchor, but the inboard end of its chain had not been secured. So when the anchor was released, it thundered down, chain and all, straight to the bottom of the Hamburg Harbor. But she soon came to a stop, and she was towed to her fitting out berth, minus one of her anchors. In light of the Titanic disaster, her fitting out was briefly paused so that an additional inner skin could be installed in her forward compartments extending well above the waterline. To test the new safety features, a fire engine was brought in from the Hamburg Fire Department and used to pump these compartments full of water. After a thorough inspection found no leaks, the compartments were pronounced watertight, giving further assurance that an impact like the one that sank the Titanic could not sink the Imperator. The massive ship was designed to carry a maximum of 5,100 people, which meant they had to find space for at least 83 lifeboats, more than four times the number carried on Titanic. That much weight on her top deck would make her dangerously top-heavy, so bays were carved out on her aft shelter deck where they could be recessed lower into her superstructure. With those safety concerns taken care of, attention could finally turn to her sumptuous interiors. Like on previous hot dog liners, Bonn once again turned to Charles Mouet, the French architect who gained world renown for designing the Ritz Hotels in Paris and London. Mouet's longtime collaborator, Arthur Joseph Davis, was selected to design the interiors of the Imperator's most direct competitor, Cunard's Aquitania, which was taking shape at Clydebank in Scotland. While the two were formerly forbidden from collaborating on the two ships, their interior spaces echo one another, though most agree that Aquitania is more subtle and refined. While their sister ships would utilize a split uptake design for their funnels, creating sweeping spaces that ran from one end of the ship to the other, Imperator maintained traditional center uptakes, but her considerable size still allowed for grand sweeping spaces that dwarfed most of her competition. And if it wasn't already apparent that Ballin's trio was built to one-up the British, a last-minute addition to the Imperator made this petty one-upsmanship abundantly clear. Just before her trials, a massive gilt bronze eagle created by Professor Bruno Cruz was installed on the new ship's bow. While they would never openly admit it, the Germans were concerned that the Aquitania, or maybe even Olympic's third sister ship, the upcoming Britannic, could sneak in a few extra feet and beat the German flagship. But even without the figurehead, Imperator would still exceed both ships somewhat comfortably. The figurehead was a garish addition to an otherwise well-balanced liner. Its protrusion proved a dangerous obstacle for docking pilots and forward lookouts. But it made it clear that the Germans would do anything to prove their nation's worth on the world stage. This fervent nationalism would soon tear Europe apart. B-52 
The Imperator began her sea trials in May 1913 and almost immediately ran aground on the River Elbe, which had not been sufficiently dredged to accommodate her over 30-foot draft. Additional tugs were sent to free her, and at the next high tide she was dislodged without any damage. As she sailed into the open North Sea to begin her trials, it became abundantly clear that the liner was critically top-heavy. She healed alarmingly at even the slightest provocation, and once she rolled, she was reluctant to return to vertical. Fixing the issue required significant modifications that would have seriously delayed her maiden voyage. With so much riding on their new flagship, Hopog decided these fixes could wait, and they accepted the liner as she was. As preparations were made for her maiden voyage, a workman filling his lighter with a tin of benzene accidentally ignited a flash fire in a storeroom. While the fire was contained to a single compartment, the blaze killed five crew members. Imperator's maiden voyage had to be delayed while the damage was repaired. Hopog released a statement blaming the delay on bad weather and inadequate docking facilities. With the Titanic still fresh in the public's mind, any hints of a bad omen or safety concerns were carefully covered up. The Imperator measured 906 feet or 276 meters in length, with a beam of 98 feet or just under 30 meters. She came in at 52,117 gross registered tons, easily making her the largest passenger ship in the world. Her four Parsons steam turbines could generate 60,000 shaft horsepower, achieving an impressive max service speed of 24 knots. She could carry 4,234 passengers across four classes, with 908 in first, 592 in second, 962 in third, and 1,772 in steerage. She was operated by a crew of 1,180. She sailed her maiden voyage to New York on June 11, 1913 with a record-setting 3,100 passengers under the command of Commodore Hans Russer with a staff of four additional captains. When she picked up her harbor pilot, Captain George Seath, at the entrance to the Ambrose Channel, he immediately noticed her unnerving stability issues. He and the other harbor pilots that would soon guide her into the piers at Hoboken would give her the beautiful nickname Limperotter. But on her maiden voyage, her passengers didn't seem to pay much attention to her rolling. When they arrived in New York, they raved over her size and sumptuous accommodations. The Imperator was the first major maiden voyage to arrive in New York since the Titanic disaster, and it seemed that the press and the public were eager to celebrate a new ocean liner. In her subsequent voyages, however, passengers soon began to complain about her persistent list. There are almost no images from this time showing her riding on an even keel. Despite the complaints, the Imperator proved highly popular and profitable, carrying far more passengers per voyage across the Atlantic than any other ship. Her fourth voyage carried an astonishing 5,000 passengers. So many, in fact, that the overwhelmed pier officials in Hoboken requested that her 1,800 steerage passengers remain on board one additional night. Just after 4 a.m. the next morning, while the ship was being loaded with coal, an alarm went off on the fire control panel in her bridge, indicating smoke in her starboard dry storerooms. The officer on watch immediately closed off the compartment, and ordered steam piped in from the boiler room to choke out the potential fire. An alarm was also set off at the pier. Stewards were ordered to evacuate the steerage passengers, and panic ensued as people poured down her gangplanks shoving past the Hoboken firefighters as they dragged their hoses on board. One of these firefighters was killed when he was overcome with smoke in the burning compartment. While the blaze was difficult to get under control, like the previous fire, the Imperator's fire containment system proved effective, and by 9 a.m. the last of the flames were extinguished. But the shore-based firefighters, probably thinking back to the tragic Hoboken fire of 1900, eagerly filled the compartment with 35 feet of water, sending the already unstable Imperator into a near-critical list. Her crew likely regretted alerting the pier. Shore-based firefighters were infamously dangerous when fighting fires on ships in port, and the situation demonstrated why. This lack of care would foreshadow the loss of the Normandy three decades later. 
Miraculously, it took her crew only two days to clean up the damage, and she was able to sail her return voyage with a full load of passengers. After two more voyages, her first season came to an end, and she was sent back to Vulcan Firk for some much needed alterations to lower her center of gravity. Nine feet were removed from each of her funnels, and the grill room at the aft end of her promenade deck was replaced with an open air veranda cafe with light keen furnishings. Some of her heavier paneling was replaced with lighter fireproof sheeting, and many of her furnishings were replaced with lighter wicker pieces. Finally, 2,000 tons of cement were added deep inside her hull as permanent ballast. When she re-entered service in the spring of 1914, these changes partially remedied the situation and no doubt made her voyages a little less, uh, terrifying. But stability issues plagued the liner for the rest of her career. During this first crossing, she encountered a major storm on the North Atlantic. Facing winds up to 90 miles per hour, her captain could barely see his bow through the maelstrom or hear his officers over the howling wind. When the storm finally broke the next morning, four lifeboats had been ripped away in the night. But worst of all, the wings of her insane eagle figurehead had been ripped away. One was gone completely. The other was wedged under her starboard anchor. The remains of the monstrosity were removed when she returned to Germany, and sadly, they were never replaced. On May 14, 1914, her sister ship, the even larger Vaterland, entered service, and the hull of the third member of the trio, SS Bismarck, was launched on June 20, 1914. It seemed that Ballin's ambitions to build a fleet greater than anything his British counterparts could muster would soon come to fruition. But in only a few months, the world would be at war. And soon, Albert Ballin's dreams would turn into a nightmare. Albert Ballin was keenly aware that a war between the German Empire and Great Britain would be a disaster for both nations. In February 1912, he joined with various other businessmen to support an attempt at an arms agreement drafted by the British. Called the Haldane Mission, the proposal aimed to cool tensions between the two nations and slow Germany's provocative naval buildup. In exchange, Britain was prepared to hand over colonies that were once a part of the Portuguese Empire. But Germany had no interest in these colonies. Instead, the Kaiser wanted a promise that Britain would remain neutral and refrain from joining any country that started a war with Germany. In the end, the two sides failed to reach an agreement that could have helped prevent the coming conflict. When World War I broke out in August 1914, the Imperator was laid up in Hamburg. For four years, the Great Liner sat idle and she quickly fell into dilapidation. The war sent Ballin into a deep depression as many Hophog ships were damaged or destroyed during the conflict. Fearing that Germany's looming defeat would mean that his life's work, including his magnificent trio of superliners, would soon be turned over to the Allies, Albert Ballin ended his own life on November 9, 1918, shortly after he learned that his friend Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated his throne. His fears came true when the Treaty of Paris turned nearly every German liner over to the Allies. The Imperator was initially passed over to the Americans, who had already seized the Vaterland and renamed her Leviathan. She was briefly used to repatriate 25,000 American troops. While there was some disagreement over who would ultimately retain the vessel, on September 20th, 1919, she was finally transferred over to the British shipping controller and she was officially handed over to the Cunard Line on November 24th. A few days later, she sailed to Southampton where she would undergo a badly needed overhaul. It was initially planned that the Imperator would begin service with Cunard on January 10th, 1920. But when she arrived in Southampton and dry docked on January 6th, it was found that the liner was in a terrible state. Part of her rudder was missing and her propellers were badly eroded. She underwent a more thorough refurbishment, and parts were borrowed from other Cunard vessels including the Transylvania and the Kermania to complete the work. The Imperator sailed her first voyage with the Cunard Line in late February 1920, 
On her return voyage, seawater began pouring into her ash ejectors during a heavy storm, causing her to develop an alarming list. The flooding extinguished several of her boilers and her speed was reduced, causing alarm amongst her passengers, who were sure that the ship was sinking. Her engineers, still relatively unfamiliar with the German ship, eventually had to break into her tank tops and pump water out from above. The situation was soon brought under control and she arrived safely in Southampton, but the incident caused a great deal of concern in the press. Questions over her seaworthiness even reached the House of Commons, and Cunard was forced to remove her from service for a more thorough refit. They promised to remove her third funnel to address stability concerns, but thankfully this never actually happened. Instead, they turned her famous restaurant into a lighter ballroom and removed all of the marble from her palatial first-class bathrooms. An additional thousand tons of pig iron were added to her hull as permanent ballast. This helped, but stability remained an issue. This overhaul would also give the Imperator a new name. She was now called the RMS Berengaria, after Queen Berengaria of Navarre, wife of Richard the Lionheart. While the new name maintained the Cunard tradition of names that ended in IA, it was the first time a Cunarder was named after a person instead of a place or province of the ancient world. A hint at the naming convention that would soon be ushered in with the next generation of Cunard queens. The Berengaria was now truly a British ship, ready to thrive through the Roaring Twenties. The Berengaria joined the Cunards Mauritania and Aquitania to complete their trio of express transatlantic liners. Despite her German heritage, being the largest liner in the fleet, she became the company's flagship. Sir Arthur Rostron, who gained notoriety while rescuing Titanic survivors as captain of the Carpathia, took command of the Berengaria in July 1920. Her many overhauls concluded in 1921 when she was finally converted from coal to oil firing. As the dust of World War I finally settled, the 1920s quickly proved a high point for transatlantic passenger travel. While new immigration laws greatly reduced the number of migrants allowed to enter the United States, tourism gained in popularity and quickly became more accessible to a wider range of people. The great transatlantic ocean liners easily adopted and passenger numbers remained strong throughout the decade. Berengaria's elegance and size made her a popular option, and prohibition laws in the United States made her and other European liners popular amongst thirsty American travelers. She quickly gained a reputation as a party ship, known for dancing, costume balls, and free-flowing liquor. She truly embodied the spirit of the Roaring Twenties. While she was in the middle of a routine transatlantic voyage in September 1925, Cunard's offices in New York received an anonymous message informing them that a bomb had been placed on board the Berengaria. The ship's officers were immediately informed of the situation and her crew commenced a thorough search, careful not to inform passengers and cause a panic. The detailed threat included a supposed time of detonation, and though their search had yet to uncover any suspicious device, a fire drill was held at the given time to ensure that passengers would be waiting at their lifeboat stations in case the threat proved real. Thankfully, it was a hoax, and the Berengaria continued to Southampton with her passengers completely unaware of the tense situation. For the rest of the decade, the Berengaria's career proved somewhat routine as her bands played on and her passengers danced late into the night. But by the 1930s, the Great Depression dealt a serious blow to the aging liner's passenger numbers. More modern ships had since entered service, and the pre-war liners, including Olympic, Mauritania, and Berengaria, were increasingly feeling like relics from the past. As she continued to age, her electric wiring began to fail, sparking random fires. None of these incidents ever proved dangerous, but it was a hard thing to hide from passengers. On one crossing, a fire broke out just before passengers were seated for dinner. The small blaze was serious enough that passengers were mustered to their lifeboat stations. The fire was quickly extinguished and passengers were free to return to dinner, but the pungent smell of burning insulation lingered for the remainder of the voyage. The same issues plagued the former Bismarck, now White Star Line's Majestic, 
But the former Vaterland, now the Leviathan, was completely rewired when she was transferred to the Americans, and she avoided the problem completely. In 1938, Cunard White Star finally had the ship rewired, but the Berengaria was already reaching the end of her career. As the recently merged Cunard White Star Line struggled to regain their footing, a number of their great legacy liners were withdrawn from service and sold for scrapping, as new liners like the Queen Mary took their place. By the end of 1938, the Berengaria had reached her end. Her fittings were auctioned off in January 1939, and she soon sailed to Yarrow, where she would be broken up. Due to her size and the outbreak of World War II, it wouldn't be until 1946 that the Great Liner was finally gone. The Imperator and her sisters marked the culmination of the pre-war ocean liner space race. She was the pinnacle of all the size, power, and luxury shipbuilders can muster. A huge, almost ridiculous demonstration of the one-upsmanship that would soon tear her away from her home country and place her under the flag of her greatest rival. But aside from the wars and conflicts that raged around her, and her ever-present list, the Imperator became another one of the most beloved ocean liners of the day. Albert Ballin aspired to build the greatest liners ever to sail the Atlantic, and with the Imperator, for a brief time, his dream became a reality. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you again to Incogni for supporting the channel. Check them out using the link below. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.